So again, we, we see in 1 Timothy 3 the qualifications of a, of a bishop and a deacon. But he says here uh, in verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. So not only is it the qualification of a bishop and a deacon to uphold these standards, but it's also the expectation of every believer to live to these standards. So it's not that there's a standard for the bishops and deacons and it doesn't apply to you men or you ladies. You know, obviously not all of these can apply to ladies, but it is an expectation to every believer that we are up to uphold this, uh, this godly atmosphere. So one of the purposes of the house of God, one of the purposes of the church is to provide a godly atmosphere for believers, isn't it? That's why it's important that there is this standard um, that's upheld in the house of God and there are certain sins that will get you kicked out of the house of God. And we're going to go over those um, today. So let's read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which is the chapter that talks about certain sins that should be shunned and should be put away from the house of God and from this gathering. And you know, yes, everyone is a sinner. Everyone has come short of the glory of God, but not everyone commits these sins that we're going to be talking about um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 1, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife, so fornication. And it says here that it's, it's reported commonly. So it's not, it's, it's not that, you know, I'm going to go, I'm not going around trying to figure out, you know, what sins are in your life and, and I'm going on a witch hunt to try and excommunicate you out of this church. But it's to the point where it's reported commonly, where everyone in the church knows that you're doing it. Everyone knows that, that it's happening and nothing's being said about it. It's just being allowed in the church of God. This is not something that we, have, we can allow in the church of God. It needs to be put away from among us. Uh, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So in the Corinthian church, they were allowing this fornication in their church that was not even heard of in the world. And, you know, we live in a day and age where, you know, they've just uh, recently in the United States made, uh, you know, redefined the definition of marriage and allowed uh, gay marriage uh, in their legal system. You know, but we can see back in the day in the, in the first century uh, Christian church that you know, adultery with, with, a, with another person's wife or with, a, with your father's wife was not even heard of in the world, let alone in the church of God. We also see here that you know, often we, we define fornication as um, you know, sex outside of marriage, and that is fornication. But that is not only what fornication is, because we see here that you know, adultery or sleeping with another person's wife is also fornication. So we don't make, you know, I personally don't believe that there's fornication, which is you know, sexual immorality outside of marriage, and then adultery is you know, uh, the sexual immorality within marriage. Fornication is just any type of sexual immorality, and adultery is a specific type of fornication. So we can see here, because if, if, you, if you define fornication as only sex outside of marriage, then how do you explain this verse? Where it says that a man has his father's wife, that's adultery, but it's called fornication. Because adultery is like a subset of fornication, if that makes sense. Verse 2, and ye are puffed up. And have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. You know, in this verse, when I read that verse, it reminds me of churches that say, oh, you know, yeah, we allow, you know, uh, adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals in our church because we're so loving. We're so, you know, we're so accepting. And, you know, the church should be a hospital for sinners. This is what I think this verse is talking about, where they're puffed up. They think they're so good that they're allowing this sin and this fornication to run rampant in their church rather than putting, a, putting it away. For I verily as absent in body but present in spirit have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. See, the reason why we, we, we need to maintain 
uh, you know, the, the, a certain standard in the house of God and to provide a godly atmosphere is because it says here in verse 6, no, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. See, if we allow this little bit of leaven in our church, it will leaven the whole lump. You are not an island. You, you are, you, when you sin, it doesn't just affect you. It affects the body of Christ. And that's why we have to keep this, this body pure. And you know what's so important? Because, because you're not an island, you not only affect other believers, but you affect the children in this church. There are young children in this church and they look up to you. You know, whether, whether you think they look up to you or not. I remember, you know, Michael one day was, I think, eating with Simon and talking about how he eats his eggs or something like that. Oh, what was it? He says, uh, uh, a snack or something like that. So Michael was saying, oh, you know, he's having his snack. And then before you know it, you know, uh, when, when Simon's eating, he's saying, oh, he wants to have a snack and things like that. But, but my point is, you know, my, my, my children, they rub off you, you know, and, and the way you behave and, and the things that we allow in this church are going to affect the children. So we need to get it out because whether you realize it or not, my children are going to look up to you. Your children are going to look up to me. And we need to provide that sort of atmosphere in the house of God. So it's a godly place for um, believers to be and for believers to grow up in and our children to grow up in. <clears throat> Verse 7, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You know, I've often seen this verse taught to say that we ought to keep the Passover. You know, saying that let us keep the feast. Um, or, or that uh, the breaking of bread and the Lord's Supper is the continuation of the Passover. You know, I don't believe that because I think what this verse is saying here is it's saying purge out the old leaven. What's the old leaven and the leaven that's leavening the lump talking about? It's talking about the sin in the church, isn't it? It's not talking about actual leaven and fermentation of bread. Uh, so it's saying purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. So that's talking about the body of Christ, the church here. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So Jesus Christ representing, uh, or the, the Passover lamb representing the Je Jesus Christ, the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. Then it says in verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So the fact that we gather together here, Jesus Christ being our Passover lamb, we are the unleavened bread that the Passover represented. So there was the Passover lamb, there was the unleavened bread that they ate, that they ate during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now we keep that feast by Jesus Christ being our Passover and we being unleavened, that is, you know, if there's fornication and there are certain sins within our church that we purge that leaven out so that we are the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle, not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or with extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. So what is he saying here? He's saying, you know, we don't want to company with fornicators within the church, but not with the fornicators of this, of this world, because if you were to not company with fornicators in general in this world, then you couldn't hang out with anybody almost, because the world is just full of fornicators. Um... Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world. It says here, For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother. So this is somebody that has a reputation of being a Christian, somebody that's in the church. So it's not just you know, a visitor that might be you know, living in fornication or somebody that's new to our church. But if they're coming along and they're called a brother, then we do not accept and we do not allow them to be a fornicator and to keep... Uh, uh, company with us. Uh, but now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such an one, no, not to eat. So what are the sins that should get a person kicked out of church? Well, number one, we, we talked about this and that's what this chapter is mainly about, is fornication. So that's any sexual immorality outside of marriage. But, you know, that includes um, 
you know, this includes homosexuality. You know, this is why we do not welcome homosexuals in our church. So if you have, you know, if you have an uncle or if you have a cousin or a friend that's a homosexual, you know, please don't invite them to this church because they're not welcome here. Um, because, the, because they're a homosexual, they're always in fornication because they're not married according to the Bible definition. So we don't want fornicators in this church, people that are living in a fornicating relationship. We don't want homosexuals in this church. Um, we don't want uh, those that are covetous, those that you know, are constantly talking about money and, idol and, and, and idolize money and money is, is the reason why they live because that's going to rub off on people because um, covetous, being, covetousness, uh, being covetous is, is dangerous and we cannot serve God or mammon. So we don't want that to come into our church. Um, let's see, if any brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, I mean, that's, uh, that's uh, self-explanatory, that you don't have any false gods, or a railer. See, this is one where we, we do allow this more so than fornication or covetousness. Uh, railing is speaking evil one of another. And, you know, this can be in the form of gossip or, you know, talking to, to each other. You know, it's all right to talk about other people, you know, positively or maybe if you're just saying what's going on. But you shouldn't be speaking evil of other people and talking negatively and talking down about other people. And that's something that we should not allow in our church and should get you kicked out. Or a drunkard, somebody that's uh, intoxicated with alcohol, or an extortioner. So this... Uh, talks about people that have dishonest business practices or people that are, are you know, blackmailing people uh, for money. With such an one, no, not to eat. So it's not even that they're just not allowed in the house of God and they shouldn't be here to eat with us, but you shouldn't even go and eat with them if they're called a brother. Um, and we're not doing this because we hate them or because we, you know, we, 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 uh, we don't want anything to do with them ever again. It's a, it's a corrective measure, just like chastening. When you chasten your child, you don't do it out of hatred. You do it because it, it's a way to chasten them and judge them in the house of God so that they will get right because, you know, we don't, we don't run the legal system. We can't punish them by law. Um, this is the way that we can hold people accountable to their sins. And it says here in verse 12, for what have I to do to judge them also that are without? So he's saying, I don't have anything to do with judging people that are outside of the church. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it is the responsibility of the church to deal with these sins and to judge these sins in the house of God. Yeah, we don't judge the sins out of the house of God and the people out in the world. But when this sin, this type of sin creeps into the church, it is up to the church to make it known and, and it is up to people in authority like myself to purge out that leaven um, and get it out of the church. 